Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with me today. We are in the 11th chapter of Luke. And while you're opening your Bible, I want to wish my brother Greg a very happy birthday. I hope he has a blessed day. Love you, my brother. All right, Luke chapter 11. Um, I could preach for several Sundays from this chapter. There is so much in it. I'm not going to do that. Today's devotion may be a little longer than normal, but it's not going to be several Sundays long. And instead of sharing a devotional thought with you, I just want to talk about three different things from this uh, chapter. The first is prayer. And uh, the first 13 verses talk about prayer. The disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, and he did. And then he told a couple of parables. And um, the big takeaway is that God does want to answer our prayers and give us good things, just like a good father wants to give his children whom he loves good things. And uh, so, so sometimes we read this and we say, well, why did Jesus tell the story about the friend who was persistently knocking on his neighbor's door to get uh, uh, at night to get some bread for some people who had showed up at his house? And, and if we're not careful, we read that parable and we come away with the idea that we have to pester God, that we have to aggravate God. We've just got to keep knocking. We've got, you know, that God is reluctant to get out of bed and help us, and, and we just got to keep pestering God. And that's not the point because the, the next story, the next parable, Jesus says, you know, you don't, you, he, he talked about earthly fathers give their kids good things. Well, God wants to do that. The parable, parable about the knocking on the door is not because God doesn't want to get out of bed and help us. The problem is we seldom knock. The, the, the issue is not with God, it's with us that we're inconsistent in knocking or we don't knock. In other words, we don't pray or we're really inconsistent in our prayer life. Um, the, the issue with, is with, with us, and I think that's part of what Jesus is uh, addressing here. I've often said in ministry, one of the things I've uh, learned is that the more, the more spiritual and demanding something is, the, the, the fewer people who come to church all the time will actually do it. So when it comes to really having a prayer life, when it comes to really witnessing and doing evangelism, <laughs> and that's Jesus said, you all got to knock. The problem isn't that I don't want to open the door. The problem is y'all don't knock very much. So, so get, get busy and knock on the door. Pray. Pray. That's the point of the parable. I was also struck in Jesus' teaching on prayer here that we are to pray for practical things but also for spiritual things because we're better at praying about practical things than we are praying about spiritual things. Um, in verses Two through four, when G this is an abbreviated version of what we call the Lord's Prayer, he said, When you pray, he said, do it like this Father, hallowed be your name. Praise God. Your kingdom come. God, I, I want your will to be done in my life, in this world, God, submitting to you. Give each of us, our, you know, give us each day our daily bread. I've got these physical needs, these practical needs, health needs, job needs, etc. And forgive us our sins. Repent, forgive. As we forgive others and lead us not into temptation, did you notice that the majority of the Lord's Prayer is about spiritual things, not practical physical things? Physical things, practical things are there. Spiritual things are there more. And, and I think one of the reasons so many of us struggle with prayer is we only pray about jobs and sickness and family issues. We don't pray about somebody's walk with God, God's will, God's kingdom. God's. When you learn to pray spiritual prayers, Scripture prayers, pray, praying Scripture, your prayer life will begin to change. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Second thing is God's kingdom. God's kingdom, which is a you know a theme in the four four gospels. Um, but in in verse twenty, um, uh, verse twenty of, of chapter eleven, um, let me find it here in my Bible. Here we go. They accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And he says, that's silly. You know, a house is not going to be divided against itself. Kingdom divided against itself. It wants to stand. Satan's not going to kick out demons. That's, that's silly. Verse 20 said, but, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, Jesus says, if I cast them out, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When you see me casting out demons, the kingdom of God is here upon you. 
And, and I started reflecting on the kingdom of God in some of these chapters back in, uh, in, uh, uh, in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, 9 and 11. We looked at it Friday, or yesterday, Monday rather, that um, when he sent out his disciples and they shared the gospel, those who believed the kingdom of God had come near to them. Those who did not believe the kingdom of God had not, had come near them as well. So anytime that you hear the gospel, the kingdom of God is there. It's right beside people, and, and they can enter it. By believe, believing. Later in Luke, in chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus will teach that the kingdom of God is, is, is not a visible, physical kingdom like America is a visible, physical nation, like China is a visible, physical nature. That's not the kingdom of God, but rather it is the presence of God in our midst. It's here, but it's a different kind of kingdom. It's the presence of God. In chapter 13, verses 18 to 21, he said the kingdom of God is, how, how do you see it? Where do you see it? In God's growing, expanding family as people believe in him. And, and in chapter 22, verse 30, Jesus said his kingdom will one day be visible and physical when he comes back at the, at the second coming. So what, what are we talking about with the kingdom of God? It is God's presence and God's lordship and God's rule and God's reign breaking into our present reality. It is the future kingdom of God breaking into the now. And what we enter it is a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical, visible kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's visible in the sense that you see God's family growing and that's his kingdom in our so when you share the gospel, you're bringing God's kingdom right up to the right up to somebody, and they can enter it by believing. When you serve in Jesus' name, you're breaking, you're 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 helping God's kingdom kingdom to break into this present reality. And and when we see lives change and people saved and enter the kingdom, they're entering. God, that's God's kingdom at work in this world. His presence here now. The third and final thing I wanted to talk about from this chapter, uh, hey, three points is like a sermon, who figured, <laughs> is uh, does Jesus only condemn the self-righteous religious people like the Pharisees? You often hear statements like this. I was listening to a podcast recently, and the speaker, who was a pastor of a prominent church, not a Baptist church, but a prominent church, um, he said something to the effect that uh, uh, when you read the Gospels, it, it, was, it, was, it was the Pharisees, it was the, it was the religious people, the religious hypocrites. That's who Jesus condemned. Jesus never condemned ordinary people. And I've heard that a lot in, in, in my life. Uh, and you, you, you hear it a lot. You, you hear secular people saying things like that. So my question is, is that statement true? Is it true? And my answer is sort of, but not completely. <laughs> Don't you love that kind of answer? Well, yeah, sort of, but not really. He did condemn the Pharisees. He did make strong negative statements toward and against the very religious who were hypocrites. But did you notice Jesus? Um, he also ate with Pharisees and visited the homes of Pharisees. He did. Read the Gospels. He did. Did he ever condemn ordinary people? Well, in Luke chapter 11, look at verses 29 and 30 in today's chapter, 29 and 30. Now, the crowds were increasing, and he began to say, who was he talking to? Not the religious hypocrites, the crowds, the masses, the ordinary people. This generation... You all, this crowd, ordinary people, this generation is a wicked generation. Hmm. That's pretty strong, negative, condemning language. 
This big old crowd. Y'all are wicked. You want a sign. You're not going to get any sign except like Jonah three days in the well. Hey, I'm going to be three days in the earth. I'm, I'm going to be buried, but I'm going to come back. You're a wicked generation. Did Jesus condemn the Pharisees more? Yes. But to say he never condemned ordinary people is, is to go further than the scripture goes. To say more is actually to ignore some things in scripture. Chapter 9 of Luke from a you know, couple days back in verse uh, 41. Chapter 9 verse 41 Jesus, this, this is when he comes down off the mountain of transfiguration where, you know, he, where Moses and Elijah appear with him and he was glorified. He comes down from the mountain and there's a crowd there. They've been hanging out with the other nine disciples and, and he turns around, Jesus turns around and he, and he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Did Jesus condemn the Pharisees more? Yes, yes, yes. But to say he never condemned ordinary people. Is is not totally an accurate statement. So stop saying it. Okay? Uh, it's an overstatement. He ate with Pharisees and sinners. He talked with Pharisees and sinners. He ate and talked with rich and poor, leaders and everyday people. Anyway, that preacher on the podcast I was talking about that said, Jesus never condemned ordinary people. He only condemned the, the really religious who were here. And it's, a mis it's an overstatement. I get the point they're trying to make, but it's an overstatement. Um, one of his examples of Jesus not condemning, you know, the woman caught in adultery, they dro drug in and threw down at Jesus' feet, and they were ready to stone her and ask him what to do. And, and, and Jesus said, he was without sin, cast the first stone, and they all, you know, dropped their stones and walked away. And, and this pastor on this podcast he, he said, this is an example. Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you. The men who condemn, this fact went on to say that the men who condemn you have all dropped their rocks and walked away. And I want to say, dude, 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 would you look at the rest of the verse because Jesus, after he said to that woman, neither do I condemn you, he then said, stop sinning. Now that's my paraphrase. What he said was, go and sin no more. See, Jesus was blunt and honest and kind and tender with everybody. Let's stop drawing lines between groups and making statements that are exaggerated that misrepresent the truth. Well, that's my <laughs> mini sermon, half of what I would do on a Sunday morning for this beautiful Tuesday. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow and I promise to be a little bit quicker. God bless you.